have your say. First, the US economy was in trouble. Now Italy could default on its debt. We're told it's too big to fail, but too big to bail out. The global financial markets are in turmoil, with concerns that the crisis in the Eurozone could trigger a second global recession, with echoes of the crisis back in 2008. Well, wherever you are in the world, how is this affecting you? We'll be hearing your concerns and looking at ways that you can protect yourself. If you want to join the conversation as ever, you are more than welcome. All of the contact details are up on screen throughout the programme. You can go to facebook.com forward slash worldhaveyoursay. And if you're tweeting, use the hashtag WHYS. We have guests in Hong Kong, the US and Scotland who are all waiting to speak with you. But first, let's get the latest on the story. Stock markets around the world remain volatile despite better than expected job news from the United States. In New York, US markets initially reacted positively to the news, with the shares on the main index, the Dow Jones, going up by 1.5%, but prices have since slipped away. In London and Paris, the main indices remain down by around 2%. The European Commissioner for Monetary Affairs has tried to reassure the markets after a week of turbulence. Asia-Pacific stocks dropped by up to 5% when markets closed there earlier. Elsewhere, human rights activists in Syria say the security forces have shot dead at least four people during demonstrations near the capital, Damascus. Thousands of protesters across the country took to the streets after Friday prayers, calling for the government of President Bashir al-Assad to go. The Thai parliament has elected Yingluk Shinawat as the country's first female prime minister. Ms Yingluk, sister of the ousted former prime minister Thaksin Shinawat, led her party to a clear victory in last month's national election. And a polar bear has killed a 17-year-old tourist and seriously injured four others in the far north of Norway. All victims are British. They were part of a larger group of tourists visiting an island in the Arctic. Well, we are joined by a number of guests to speak with you. If you want to pick up the phone and join the conversation, you're welcome as ever. You can call us, country code 44 20 70 83 72 72. The World Have Your Say team will be delighted to take your call. Well, we can speak to Greg Ip. He is the US editor for The Economist. He joins us from Washington. We can also speak to Theo Leggett, who is the BBC's business correspondent. He's in London. And also Kirstine, who is a student at the University of Glasgow. Welcome all of you to work to have your say. First of all, let's pull up an email that will start our discussion. Timothy is a lawyer in California. He commented on the Wall Street Journal. He says, the Great Depression too is upon us. Economic historians will describe it as such in 20 to 40 years time from now. There may be green shoots from time to time, but this was true during the Great Depression. Greg, do you agree with that? No, I don't agree with that, uh, Chloe. The, uh, during the Great Depression, total economic output fell by 25 to 30 percent. Even with the newly revised figures, which show that the recession we went through is worse than we thought, it's only about 5 percent. It was a very bad recession. It was nothing compared to the depression that we went through in the 1930s, or even some of the sort of mid depressions countries like Scandinavia, for example, experienced in the early 1990s. But there's a, some truth to the statement, because what we're experiencing right now is a recovery that's barely worthy of the name. I mean, GDP per capita hasn't advanced in five years. And what we now know is that the economy is growing so slowly, there has been no drop at all in unemployment in the, the two years since the recovery began. I think a closer analogy would not be the Great Depression in America of the 1930s, but the Japanese experience of the 1990s, the lost decade. We are going through, in some sense, a predictable script where after a financial crisis, the busted financial system and the furious effort by everybody, whether it's banks or households or businesses or governments now, to pay down all the debts that they've taken on holds back growth for a very long time. Interesting you say that, Greg, because talking to someone earlier today, they were watching the news with me and they said, really, are we out of the recession? I never realised we were. And as you say, some people seeing it as just a short recovery. Theo Leggett, BBC Business Correspondent, what do you make of the idea of this Great Depression too? Well, I agree that we're not in a Great Depression equivalent to what we saw in the 1930s. But what we are seeing really is the second stage of what began back in 2007. Um, when the financial crisis erupted, government 
governments were left in a very difficult position. They needed to support the financial industry to stop banks collapsing. To do that, they had to churn out an enormous amount of money. They had to subsidize the banks. They put into place stimulus programs to try and get economies moving again. Remember, this was in the midst of the credit crunch. And as a result of that, they ended up with very high levels of public debt and high deficits. What we're seeing now is that as the recovery seems to be slowing down, there's a great deal of pressure at the same time to take measures to cut debt and to cut deficits. And those measures, austerity programs, are not good for economic growth. So. Really, you can't disconnect what we're seeing at the moment to what has been happening for the past four years. It's a continuation. And yes, the uh, spur of growth that we saw in the wake of the financial crisis now seems to be slowing down, so much so um, that American jobs figures like the ones we saw today, which were really quite weak, were welcomed as good news in a bad climate. Well, Greg and um, Theo, I want to introduce you to Kirstine, who joins us on Skype from um, Glasgow. She's a university student there. Kirstine, how worried are you when you hear these comments by the likes of Theo and Greg? Already thought. Um, personally, to me, it felt like the recession that we were coming out of was still ongoing, and anyone I would speak to in Glasgow or kind of Scotland in general or anything my social group would say the same. The recession didn't end for us, it didn't get better. We're still struggling to get jobs. So hearing just, you know, a couple of hundred thousand jobs in America or kind of only a few thousand jobs growth in the UK isn't really encouraging when you've got about a hundred people trying to chase one job at a time here. Kirsten, so, what's your experience? Are you, are you Have you had a job? or are you just studying to get a job? Just tell us a little bit about yourself. I'm a mature student. I, straight from kind of high school, I went to work and I worked uh, in the defence industry. I actually worked in fast lane. And um, then I moved on into the financial industry and obviously I moved into the financial industry in kind of around 2008, so it didn't really work out. So I decided after about a year of being on Job Seekers Allowance to study at night school to get into university because I didn't really have many qualifications. So I'm about to enter the second year of a law degree at the University of Glasgow. So I'm hoping the job situation will get better, but I'm not really holding out much hope for it because I was hoping that perhaps by the time I'd finished my training, about four or five years, things would improve. But it's looking increasingly unlikely and I may be struggling to find a job even once I've graduated and qualified well into my 30s is my expectation now. Well, Kirstine, do stay with us. And wherever you're watching around the world, you can pick up the phone. You can ask Greg or Theo a question if you're worried, if you're concerned about the financial turmoil at the moment after the US debt crisis and this news that Italy could now default on its debt. We're told some people are saying it has echoes of the 2008 crisis. Could we be heading for a second global recession? You can pick up the phone. You can call us. Country code 44 20 70 83 72 72. Kirstine, as I'm asking people around the world if they have a question for Greg or for Theo. Do you yourself have anything you want to ask them? Just in general, obviously a lot of people are searching for work at the moment. They're either going into education or they're just having to remain um, on benefits and things of that kind of world over. What do you think is the best thing for people to do to try and make themselves kind of more recession proof? We're obviously seeing a lot of the problems with globalisation would you say people should learn languages to make it easier for them to work abroad, to kind of go where the work is? Well, I'd say for a start, um, you're talking exactly the right lines. When there are few jobs around, there is competition for those jobs, and that therefore the people who have something else to offer, like a language or a particular skill, are going to be in demand. The other thing we need to have at the moment is patience, because the past has shown that after an economic downturn, things do pick up, but it does take time. And if you look at the economic climate at the moment, there are an awful lot of problems out there that will need to be resolved. We can't expect things to pick up quickly. That is isn't just going to happen. What we are seeing at the moment, though, is that recovery is happening at different pace in different areas. So, for example, within the Eurozone, Germany is actually doing relatively well. The United Kingdom, not so well. And, of course, Scotland, um, part of the United Kingdom, there are specific problems in that region as well. So, you know, you're, you're talking exactly the right things. Make yourself as employable as possible. Therefore, when there is a queue, you might find yourself closer to the top of it. 
Lots of people have been getting in touch with us at World Have Your Say throughout the day saying, how can I protect myself if this really is going to get bad again? We've started to recover. Maybe there's going to be a second recession. What can I do? Is there a simple answer, Greg? No, there isn't a simple answer. I mean, this, the trouble that we're going through is, is global. I think just to you know, expand on some of the points Theo was just making, that as an individual, um, you know, what uh, the last speaker was saying is exactly the right thing to do. Here in America, uh, if you look at who's unemployed, you find that everybody has suffered, but the people who suffered the least are the ones who have the most education, those with a college degree, and those who have suffered the most are those who perhaps didn't even finish high school. The other phenomenon is that, at least again in America, is that the degree of high uh, long-term unemployment, those who have been uh, unemployed for at least 26 weeks, is extremely high, and employers have been especially reluctant to hire those people because they sort of take a view, perhaps not a fair view, but uh, a view nonetheless, that their skills have atrophied and that they would rather hire somebody who's uh, been in the, who has only been out of the job market for a short period. So that suggests that if your prospects are especially bleak, well, there's two possible things. One is go back to school, improve your skills, and the other is to try and, you know, find part-time or consulting work, anything that, you know, keeps you in the game, keeps the work habits alive, and gives Gives you something to present to the employer when the opportunity presents itself. Something to keep you ticking, ticking over, Greg. Um, I'm going to thank Kirstine, who's joined us from Scotland. There's lots of people who want to ask both of you questions, so I'm keen to introduce more people into the conversation. Roger is on the line from Jordan. I know, Roger, you've been listening to all of our conversations so far. What would you like to say? Well, I think uh, that we are paying the price for the bad policies that really started early 90s, where uh, greed has been very dominant and more and more people want to become rich and richer overnight. And this is basically, to make it very simple, that's what we're going through right now. Uh, I feel globalization might be another issue where we were not fully ready for that. The, uh, underdeveloped countries were really overtaken by the wealthy countries and they were uh, the resources were utilized by the richer countries that's another thing there was another another unfortunate things that we went through the, it was actually the perils the perils of weather the perils of volcanoes of uh, earthquakes and this had affected the price of commodities and especially food in the last couple of years. And the uh, poor countries could not really handle those prices. Who wants to pick up on those points? Uh, well, I, I agree with some of what he said, but not all of it. For example, he's absolutely right that bad luck, you know, in the form of bad weather and the disaster in Japan has played an important role in terms of putting a huge damper on the economy in the second quarter of this year. It's one reason I'm helpful, although not, you know, that a lot of confidence around it, that the July employment report is the start of a modest rebound in the second half. And the big rise in petrol prices and other commodity prices, which has so uh, hit so hard countries in the Middle East, like where the caller was uh, calling us from, have been also a major problem. His point about globalization I don't fully agree with. I mean, if you look around the world, you can see that countries that globalized a lot, like China and Germany, are doing quite well. And that in countries like the US and the UK, which are suffering so much, the main source of pain is the least globalized industry of all, and that's housing. So going back to the point he was making about greed, to the extent that many of the countries like Ireland, like Spain, like uh, the UK, that are suffering the most are paying the price for an absolutely spectacular bubble in real estate state that was driven by greed or foolishness, call it what you want. With that, I completely agree. And I would add to that that what we saw over the past four years was also motivated to a certain extent by political failings. Um, the failings of regulators and of politicians to identify where bubbles were likely to occur, where things could be getting out of control, and to take action to mitigate that. Roger, would you like to respond? Yes, well, actually, if you uh, look back in the last couple or three years, Why? Wh what was the main cause of this uh, economic crisis? Uh, it was, it started out in real, in real estate and housing in the U.S., where people really got more and more greedy and they want to make more and more money, and it was the rules and the regulations that allowed them to do this. They're, they're, I think this was very important, and now they realized that it was kind of too late, that they did not have the good enough rules and regulations to regulate all this. 
Roger, thank uh, you for joining uh, us from George. And I'm just going to cut in there because I say we've got lots of people getting in touch with us. Shazab has emailed from Pakistan. The crisis has closed the door to America when it comes to the Asian markets. And it's projected a selfish, selfish image of America to the international markets. If you want to get involved in the conversation on Twitter, you can use the hashtag WHYS. Other hashtags being used are crisis and markets. And if you want to join the conversation, pick up the phone. You can call us, country code 44. 20, 70, 83, 72, 72. We'll take a quick break and then we'll carry on talking. Hello, I'm Chloe Tilly. Welcome back to World Have Your Say. We're getting calls coming in from India, Eritrea, Nepal, Morocco and Denmark. We're joined by a couple of guests here to answer any questions that you have about the global financial turmoil. Greg Ipp is the US editor for The Economist in Washington and also Theo Leggett, who is a business, BBC business correspondent. We've had a question in from Adnan in Karachi. He called in on country code 44 2070 he asks, isn't it ultimately the greed of the derivative markets that has caused this? Greg, a, a quick response if you would. No, I don't think so. I think derivatives played a minor role in the uh, crisis that we had, perhaps in things like credit derivatives. But honestly, I mean, uh, you had a situation where houses in many countries, the United States, UK, all around the world, got too expensive, well beyond what their fundamental value was. And in countries like Spain, where derivatives did not play a big role, are suffering immensely because of the collapse in housing values and construction, which is really hurting their banks. I'd say also there was an element that the uh, things that were being sold and bought on the market became too complex. Uh, we had admissions in the wake of the financial crisis that the people who were buying and selling mortgage-backed securities didn't really know what they were taking on, didn't know that the assets underpinning those securities, the houses, um, wouldn't necessarily retain their value, and that therefore people didn't know what they were taking on, what potential exposures they had, and where the losses might fall. And it was a crisis of confidence because people suddenly realized that they had all these assets and they didn't know the true value of them that helped to trigger the financial crisis four years ago. So there was an element of complexity in there as well, rather than greed. Well, Greg and Theo, I want to introduce you to Josh, who joins us on the line from Manchester. Josh, welcome to World Have Your Say. You're in the UK, in the north of England. What's the point you'd like to make? Well, my question is, you know, I'm a, I'm a digital consultant in Manchester, UK, as you said, um, and I, I don't really understand what the relevance to me directly uh, is. You know, these stories of markets crashing and a lot of investor confidence, you know, I haven't got um, many savings. Um, I, I've got money to get by, but it all seems very detached. It sounds like something that is happening separate to, separate to the things that are going to affect me. Well, I think it's important to draw a line here between what's been making the headlines over the past few days, which is a market problem, big falls on the stock markets, and what the wider economic picture, for example, the sovereign debt crisis in Europe. Now, the market problem taken on its own, um, the markets are all about property, things that people own, shares in companies. Now, if you have a pension in the United Kingdom, uh, the chances are that a good chunk of that is invested on the stock market. So when the markets fall, potentially people are losing a great deal of money. But there is another side to this as well, which is the economic fear that is driving the markets. And if you look at the situation in continental Europe, if we're in a situation where Spain or Italy is at risk of not being able to meet its debts, um, then you have a loss of confidence in those countries. And part of the consequence of that is that banks based in those countries start to struggle to borrow the money they need in order to lend onwards. And if that were to prove infectious, then other banks in Europe could get tied into this. And we'd be seeing the same kind of credit crunch that we saw four years ago, which sparked off a Europe-wide recession and indeed a recession in the United States. So all these things are interconnected. And at the end of the day, they can have an effect on your life. If, you, if banks aren't lending to one another, then they're not lending to businesses. And businesses, therefore, aren't taking on staff. And therefore, there are fewer job opportunities around. Everything is, at some level connected. Josh? Yes, no, I, I, that begins to make, make a bit more sense. And obviously, you mentioned things like pensions and savings. And I suppose I do have a small pension, but it's not something that one thinks about at such a young age, I imagine. Um, and the thing about jobs, you know, jobs being created or jobs being lost because banks can't, can't invest, it does sound like 
Um, it does sound like something that could affect me, certainly, because I'm obviously looking for work all the time. Um, but I'm still skeptical that um, one-off events can have such long, far-reaching consequences. James, well, do you feel there's been... Sorry, um, Josh, do you feel there's been enough leadership? Um, you, you say that you've been confused when you look at banks, when you look at leaders of, of countries around Europe, President Obama in America. Do you feel there's been enough decisive action, in your view, to, to tackle this and reassure people? I, th I think, actually, the truth is I haven't seen any decisive leadership about this issue. Uh, all I've seen is sort of dithering, certainly in, in the USA, the, sto the story out of that as there has been people disagreeing about you know, what to do with uh, raising the, the debt ceiling. Um, it doesn't sound like someone's come forward, taken control and said, OK, we need to do this, this and this to, uh, to solve this problem. It just sounds like um, people sort of papered around the edges a few years ago when this all happened last time, and now it's happening all again. Um, and that's concerning because of all the money that you know, uh, has been lent out to banks, bailed out, that sort of thing. And you know, as someone who you know, works, pays taxes, that sort of thing, and is being told your taxes are going to uh, bail out companies that aren't working, you know, banks that aren't working properly, or countries that aren't, haven't managed their own debt, it just sounds like uh, the same old thing over and over again. Let's bring in Yashraj, who is on the line from Delhi. Welcome to World Have Your Say. What's your point, Yashraj? Yeah, I actually had a question for the panelists. Uh, with yet another financial crisis looming in Europe and the USA, do you see equity funds and MNCs diverting more capital into economies like India, which was relatively insulated during the first recession because uh, most of our phenomenal growth is driven by internal demand and uh, coupled with uh, robust financial and fiscal policies? Greg, so do would you, you like see, to pick uh, up on that? Funds? Sure. Uh, yes, in fact, I believe we've already seen that. In fact, you might want to brace yourself for even more foreign capital coming into your countries because the probabilities are rising that the Federal Reserve here in the United States is going to respond to the weakness in American growth with another program of quantitative easing, which is purchasing bonds with newly created money. And the last time they did that, it sort of like sent money scurrying off in search of other uh, opportunities, much of, what, of which was in foreign countries. Now, now, you're absolutely right. India, China, Brazil barely had, well, no recession at all, uh, speaking of India. India and China, and they have continued to do well because they have very strong domestic growth. Now, they cannot remain insulated from what's going on in the rest of the world forever, but for now, they're in the sort of the fortunate position that their problem is not like a significant shortfall of demand, which is what the UK and the US are dealing with, but overheating. Well, I'd like to thank Greg Ip, US editor for The Economist, joining us from Washington, and also to Theo Leggett, the BBC business correspondent. That's all for now, but we'll carry on speaking in the next few minutes. Hello, I'm Chloe Tilly. Welcome to World Have Your Say. Along with the slump in the financial markets across the world, another story driving your online discussions is the continuing violent crackdown on protesters by the regime in Syria. The US Secretary of State Hillary Clinton says the Syrian government has killed at least 2,000 people in its attempts to crush the demonstrations. Meanwhile, Syrian state TV has broadcast new images from inside the besieged city of Hama, saying troops had put down an armed rebellion. Residents say tanks opened fire, killing 100 civilians. Well, we'll speak to Syrians about what response they want from the world. More sanctions, more statements from world leaders, or direct military intervention. The conversation is already underway at facebook.com forward slash world have your say. And if you're tweeting, you can use the hashtag WHYS. In a moment, we'll be speaking to Syrians and Kurdish and Iranian bloggers. But first, let's get right up to date with the main news stories this hour. Stock markets around the world remain volatile despite better than expected job news from the United States. In New York, US markets initially reacted positively to the news, with shares on the main index, the Dow Jones, going up by 1.5%. But prices have since slipped away. The markets in London and Paris have just closed. Earlier, the European Commissioner for Monetary Affairs tried to reassure the markets after a week of turbulence. Asia-Pacific stocks dropped by up to 5% when markets closed there earlier. 
Human rights activists in Syria say the security forces have shot dead at least four people during demonstrations near the capital, Damascus. Thousands of protesters across the country took to the streets after Friday prayers, calling for the government of President Bashir al-Assad to go. The Thai parliament has elected Yinluk Shinawat as the country's first female prime minister. Ms Yinluk, sister of the ousted former prime minister Taksin Shinawat, led her party to a clear victory in last month's national election. And a polar bear has killed a 17-year-old tourist and seriously injured four others in the far north of Norway. All victims are British. They were part of a larger group of tourists visiting an island in the Arctic. Well, to start our discussion on Syria, with me is Ruweda Mustafa, who is a Kurdish blogger and activist. She joins me here in our London studio. We're also joined by Ayad al-Baghdadi, who is a blogger and tweeter and joins us from Dubai. And also Golnar Esfandiari, who is a journalist and blogger in Washington. She's editor of Iran blog Persian Letters. Welcome all of you to World Have Your Say. Ruweda, first of all, your thoughts on, on what we've heard in recent days and, and the real clampdown in Syria? Well, just yesterday, uh, 106 people were killed by the uh, tyrannical regime that claims legitimacy. What's happening in Syria is unacceptable and we've seen world leaders literally be silent for too long. For the past six days, Hama has been under siege. They've had no electricity, no water and all communication has been cut. What's happening in Syria uh, is literally, like I've said, not just unacceptable, but we need world leaders to step up how much they're putting pressure on Bashar. We've seen them expand sanctions, but in reality, sanctions only hurt the people and not the leadership. And what we need right now is for the Arab League to actually speak out. They've been silent for too long. We understand that Syria is not like Tunisia or Libya, but what's happening right now needs world attention and the massacre of the innocent civilians must stop. Well, Rueda, let me introduce you to Golnar, who joins us now. Golnar, what do you make of the idea of the Arab League stepping in and world leaders stepping up that pressure? It's not like there hasn't been any reaction from, international, from the international community to what's happening in Syria. I think um, people want to see more reaction. For example, there have been call on President Obama to ask President Assad to step down. But I think in general it's up to the Syrian people to decide about that. It's a matter of the Syrian people. It's not up to the other countries to tell um, Assad to step down. And the other question is that even if they do that, would that change the situation on the ground? Would that make a uh, stop the killings? I don't think so. The difficulty, Golnar, is the Syrian people are out on the streets, in some cases in tens of thousands, and they're asking for President Assad to step down, and he's not listening. So is it right for the world to stand by and just watch the atrocities that, that are being carried out according no, absolutely. to the I, US, I, for example. I think, I, can, I, I think no one can s just stand by and, and look at people being killed in the streets of Syria. I mean, there's been a, a wave of solidarity, international solidarity, um, uh, everywhere. Uh, people are touched by what they see in Syria, by those horrible videos of children being killed by security forces. But what I say is that we cannot um, uh, expect um, politicians to react emotionally. They have their own calculations. They have their own uh, policies. They have to think about their interests. This is how it works. Ayad al-Baghdadi, welcome to the conversation. What would you like to say? Well, I would agree with uh, your previous guest. Uh, this revolution was made in Syria, and it will end in Syria. Uh, foreign pressure, I think, will just make it worse. Um, of course, it is very difficult to, to just stand by and watch people being killed. But the fact remains that military pressure, especially foreign intervention, is going to play right into the hands of the Assad regime. Uh, this is a regime that has at least uh, put out the propaganda that it is a regime of resistance and a regime of uh, standing up to the West. And uh, if, we, if, if uh, there's going to be any saber rattling, so to speak, it's going to play right into their hands. Ruweda? Well, 
I understand, obviously, military intervention is out of the question, and I agree. But verbal uh, or public statements being made by world leaders is necessary because the Syrian people need solidarity, not just from individuals. They need world leaders to assure them that, yes, their calls for freedom, for democracy, for self-determination are right, and they must be protected. To say that uh, uh, the Syrian regime claims resistance, yes, they do. But it doesn't mean that the Western leaders should just sit back in silence. Fine, let's not hear the Western leaders. What about the Arab leaders? They haven't been saying much. So I stand by saying that we need more leaders, more politicians being assertive that what Bashar is doing is not only wrong, but immoral, and we need to hear it. Golna? You know, as I said, I think um, there has been some reactions. I, I guess people in Syria want to hear more reactions from world leaders, more condemnations of the, uh, of the serious human rights abuses that are taking place in that country. Uh, <clears throat> maybe more sanctions would help. Um, I'm not really an expert. Let's leave that to expert. Or uh, referring what's happening now in Syria to the International Criminal Court. Maybe that would help uh, to some degree. But calling on President Assad to step down, I think that's not up to the world leaders, Arab leaders. It's up to the Syrian people. The Syrian and they people have, have called that. for Bashar to step down, but they need world leaders to reassure the protesters who are going out every day risking their own lives. Just yesterday, 106 people died. Just today, a couple hours ago, I was told at least three people died, among them a 15-year-old boy. So they need world leaders to reassure them that what they're doing, their fight, is right and it will go on and they will succeed. I understand that we don't want world leaders to pick their nose in Syrian's affair, but it's necessary that the population understand that they're not just fighting a lost cause, that they're not just against a tyrannical regime with no way out. They need people uh, and world leaders to uh, intervene. But I'm not saying intervene in terms of military, not at all, but to, to say something, to, to reassure the public that your lives that are being lost on a daily basis is not just for a, 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 a popcorn revolution. But I think they've been doing agree, that. Uh, for example, just there. last week, um, Secretary of uh, State uh, Hillary Clinton here in Washington met with Syrian activists. You had um, Ambassador Ford, uh, U.S. Ambassador to uh, Syria, visiting Hama. And then right after that, you had the Syrian regime saying, oh, that this is a proof that the opposition is being backed, um, that it's the opposition is part of the foreign conspiracy. So I think that's why world leaders should condemn what's happening, the human rights abuses, of course, but they should also be cautious not uh, to look like they're interfering in what's happening in Syria, because that could damage the opposition and the people who are right now out in the streets calling for freedom. Ayad, I know you were trying to get in. Well, I, would, I would agree with Ruwaida that it's... Uh, well, the, the Syrian regime has definitely lost credibility, especially with the recent UN vote uh, just a couple of days ago. Um, I think that we, we need to step forward, not just with condemnation. I think this regime needs to be delegitimized. Um, maybe, maybe we could remember something like what happened in Libya before the uh, intervention. I mean, of course, I'm not suggesting that we lead up to, the, to an intervention, but definitely this regime should not be uh, taken seriously as the representative of the Syrian people. Well, we're I know that there are, sorry, there are sorry groups. Sorry to jump in, Ayat. has lost its legitimacy, and, and, and world leaders have been saying that. President Obama has said that. Secretary of State Clinton has said that. Um, how else? I mean, a regime that kills its own, own people loses legitimacy. That's obvious. And people have been saying that. I, I, I just don't there, understand what else There have to be, there have to be some concrete expect. steps there. They've got to cut off their ties to ensure that when they say Syria regime has lost its legitimacy, it's not just fancy words. Cut off your ties with Syria exactly. and reassure the people that, yes, absolutely, what you're fighting for is legitimate and you will win. I, I, would, I would add also reaching out to opposition groups. I know that uh, Dr. Haytham al mana for example, has, has uh, declared that uh, the opposition groups are trying to set up some sort of a, what he called the shadow government. That was uh, maybe three weeks ago. So I would, I, would, I would say that they, they should uh, reach out to them, even if uh, just in, uh, as a matter of uh, solidarity. OK, Ayad and um, Golna and also Ruweda, we have to take a quick break. We're getting calls from China, Jamaica, Tunisia, Uganda, Japan and Kazakhstan. We'll carry on talking in a few minutes' time.
Hello, I'm Chloe Tilly. Welcome back to World Have Your Say. We're discussing whether the international community should intervene in Syria. Lots of you have been getting in touch with this conversations underway at Facebook, facebook.com forward slash World Have Your Say. And Krupa from the World Have Your Say team is taking your calls and monitoring those comments. Krupa, what are people saying? Well, the lines are busy. We've just had calls from Norway, Turkey and Nepal. Um, but the Twitter sphere is also very busy. Ayar tweets from Dubai, may we remind the world that no mosques in Hama were allowed to hold Friday prayers. Nermeen is in Cairo also on Twitter and she says the world's silence is beyond me when it comes to the Syria massacre. Uh, and I've just spotted this tweet. This is just coming from May Saloon and she says I've just got word that two of my relatives were injured in Hama. The army is going into each and every house. It's a complete state of war. Now many of you are tweeting using the hashtag Ramadan massacre. You can also tweet using the hashtag WHYS and we'll be sure to try and read it on air. Krupa, thank you very much for keeping us updated. Still with us is Ruweda, Ayad and Golnar. Um, your final thoughts really on where this situation in Syria will end. Ruweda, your thoughts? I personally want to hear the Western government saying from this, from this day onwards, we do not recognise the Syrian government's legitimacy for violating the human rights of its own population, for killing uh, not just uh, uh, adults but also children who are caught up amidst this violence and for uh, um, violating the international human rights law. That's what I want to hear. Saying that some leaders have spoken uh, out of condemnation is not enough. We need to hear more of that condemnation. We need to assert more world pressure and I hope that an, the 1982 massacre will not be repeated in Syria this time around. Golna? I think we need more than just words uh, condemnation. There have been condemnation. We need more, of course, moral support for the people who are out there in the streets. But we also need to see actions. I think it would be good. I don't know if um, rights activists are already doing that, documenting the human rights abuses or that are taking place in Syria and building a case, a case that would, could be sent to the International Criminal Court. Do you think the situation will end with President Assad stepping down or in some way leaving power? It's everyone's guess. I don't see President Assad ste stepping down. He seems to be very determined to crush uh, the, the Syrian spring or Syrian summer. Um, he's using a lot of force. So no, I, I don't think he would uh, voluntarily um, uh, give away power and leave. Ayat? I'm not going to discount the need for uh, world pressure, but uh, the make or break factor is going to be within Syria. Uh, I would say that foreign pressure or world pressure in general is going to be the 10 to 20 percent factor, but 80 percent of the pressure has to come from within. And uh, I get the feeling that events in Syria are reaching a watershed right now. Um, I know many people might, might be saying that it might be a little uh, premature to assume that the uh, regime might uh, implode, but uh, I get the feeling that it might not be that far away. Uh, I'd also em emphasize the need for humanitarian aid because uh, uh, things in Hama and in, uh, even in Deir Zur are really tragic and uh, the closest neighbor is going to be Turkey and I think Turkey will have to uh, open the borders for not only for refugees but also for humanitarian aid. Ruwaydi, you were nodding at one point then. Do you think President Assad will step down briefly if he would? He has no choice. It, it, the protesters will not back down even if they are killed one by one. The last Syrian standing will ensure that, that President Bashar will step down and I am sure they will be the ones having the last laugh at the end of this revolution. Well, Ruweda, Ayad and Galnar, thank you all for joining us on today's World Have Your Say. Of course, this doesn't mean that the conversation ends here. You can carry it on at the blog worldhaveyoursay.com or at Facebook, facebook.com forward slash worldhaveyoursay. If you want to carry on the conversation on air, you can listen on World Service Radio, 17 hours GMT. Ben James will be joining you then and I will speak to you again very soon. Thanks for tuning in. Наша пятигрядка в